Couple of announcements now before I get underway. Um, number one, I think we'll meet in here from now on for two reasons. Number one, I think it's a little better venue. And number two, it uh, keeps the maintenance people from having to move tables in and out all the time. So a double-barreled uh, sword there. Uh, today we're going to talk about water. Of all the things that I talk about, talked about, and will talk about in this class, and some are very important, none, none comes to the magnitude of water. Uh, that is the lifeblood of the West. John Wesley Powell's famous comment was, the history of the West will be measured in acre feet of water. If you think water is important now, come back in about 10 or 15 years. It's really going to become important. How you doing, Molly? Um, next week, uh, we have talked about Aspen and all the trails between Crest of Butte Gothic and Aspen. So next week, the whole lecture is going to be on Aspen with Crested Butte as a sidelight. Because the jumping off point to Aspen was Gothic, the jumping off point to Aspen was Crested Butte, until Aspen got a railroad in 1887. I mean, it was nothing. I mean, all the supplies had to be brought in from here, and all the ore had to be taken out to here. A little blurb also, Flouching tomorrow night, Polka Dance, Maxwell's. Starts around 8.30. I love to dance the polka. So show up. All right, today is water, and you know, we're going to talk a little bit about water in this area, but I'm going to talk about more about water as being very important in the West. So last time at the end of the hour, I talked about Zebulon Pike and Stephen Long coming out to the American West in the early 1800s, and both referring to this area as a great American desert. Uh, today, you go into Kansas, Nebraska, eastern Colorado, and you see waving fields of wheat, and everybody said, how could those guys have been so wrong? Well, they were not wrong. Without irrigation, that is a near desert. It almost hits the desert category of 11 inches of rain a year. Got a little more than that, and sometimes a little less than that. And then I finished off with John Wesley Powell. A man who understood the West and understood water better than any man who ever lived before or after. In a great report called Arid Regions of the West, 1877. It'll not duplicate what I said last time, except to say that John Wesley Powell believed that without irrigation in the West, you were dead. Nobody is going to be able to farm adequately. Nobody is going to be able to ranch adequately. Nobody's going to be able to do anything adequately without water, and there isn't very much water. So enough on John Wesley Powell. In the 1920s, a new professor at the University of Texas was hired, and his name was Walter Prescott Webb. And Walter Prescott Webb wrote a definitive book on the West by a man named Emerson Huff called The Way West in which, and I think I mentioned this at the end of the hour last time, Emerson Huff said that the West had been settled by the axe, the horse, the boat, and the gun, the rifle. And Walter Prescott Webb said, it may have been settled by the rifle, but it sure as hell wasn't settled by the axe and the boat, because there are no trees to cut down and there are no navigable rivers. And Walter Prescott Webb wrote one of the greatest books on the American West ever written, and he simply called it The Great Plains. And I'm going to take about 10 minutes today to describe what Webb said. And a lot of it involved water, like John Wesley Powell. Walter Prescott Webb, his basic thesis is that once anybody passed the Mississippi River, and began to do business by farming or ranching or anything else, everything had to be done in a different way than it had been done in the Ohio Valley, the Mississippi Valley, or the Appalachian Tidewater area. The conditions were totally different. So Webb gave 10 geographic characteristics of the Great Plains, of which eastern Colorado was part of, and 
Then he said, here is how each one of those geographic factors molded the area. So here we go in about 10 minutes. I'll start it off today. Number one said, Walter Prescott Webb, the Great Plains is characterized by a level to rolling surface. You're not going over any plateaus, over any mountain passes, not too many turns. You just go right across the prairie. Secondly, he said, it is an area that is unforested. There are no trees out there. The only trees you find on the Great Plains are right alongside of a river or carefully cultivated in one's yard. You're not going through any big hemlock stands or maple forests out on the Great Plains. Number three said, Webb, it is an area of little rainfall. 20 inches or less. Closer to you get to the Rocky Mountains, the less rain falls. Down to about 11 inches, 12 inches in eastern Colorado, with the desert category being 11. Number four said Webb, the Great Plains is characterized by something that we saw a lot of today, high wind velocity. The average wind in the Great Plains, the average wind in the Great Plains is 10 to 12 miles an hour. Blows all the time. In the great song, Oklahoma, there's a line, when the wind comes sweeping down the plains. And the reason it blows all the time is there ain't nothing to stop it. Number five said, Webb, the area is characterized by tremendous grassland. Before the cattlemen came in, the grass grew up to my waist and 13 million buffalo had existed on it for a million years or more. Number six said, Webb, the area is characterized by a unique form of animal life. Every animal on the Great Plains, except the coyote and the wolf, are grass eaters. This is the theory of evolution. In an area where there's nothing else to eat if you're not tough enough, you better learn how to eat grass or, as Darwin said, you either adapt, die, or get the hell out. Those are your options. Two types of animals, the antelope and the jackrabbit, are known for their speed and they stick to the open country depending on their speed for safety. Antelope can run 55 miles an hour for a mile. Jackrabbit is not particularly fast. He'd probably go about 20 miles an hour. But if any running back in the NFL could patent the moves of a jackrabbit, they'd be worth millions. Jackrabbit, they say, can turn on a dime and give you some change. Now, I've seen three coyotes working together out by Burlington, and they can get a jackrabbit. One coyote can't do it. Two coyotes can't do it. Three coyotes can because a jackrabbit make a fool of a coyote. Running along the prairie about 20 miles an hour, a jackrabbit, wham, right hand turn, 20 miles an hour, coyote, 20 yards to stop, come back, start chasing the jackrabbit. In addition, all animals on the Great Plains can get along with little or no water supply. Jackrabbit, prairie dog, need none. And lastly, all the animals on the Great Plains said Webb are extremely shy and had to be hunted with long-range weapons. Number seven said Webb, the Great Plains is characterized by a unique form of enemy, and that is the Plains Indian, on horseback, not riding in canoes as they did east of the Mississippi River, and totally dependent upon the buffalo for their existence. Clothing, teepees, food, everything came from the buffalo, and the white man knew very early, kill the buffalo, kill the Indian. Number eight, the Great Plains is characterized by very hard soil for agriculture. The first Missouri farmer, if he was able to get a wooden plow into the ground, immediately saw it break. There's no way you're getting a wooden plow into that hard soil tramped down by 13 million buffalo and very little rain. That's what made it hard. Number nine said Webb, Great Plains is characterized by very few navigable rivers. 
None are navigable year-round. You're not taking any steamboats out on the Platte River or the Arkansas or the Rio Grande or the Colorado. And number 10 said, Webb, the Great Plains is characterized as an area that makes up about between one-fifth and two-fifths of the total land area of the U.S. Those are the 10 geographic characteristics. As I always tell my students, you say, okay, so what? And here's the so what as we go back and take a look at them one by one. What about the level to rolling surface? That allowed the cattle drives to come from Laredo, Texas, all the way north. Nothing to stop them. That allowed the California, Mormon, Oregon, and other trails to exist from the east to the west. Nothing to stop them. And that allowed the Transcontinental Railroad. Didn't have to worry about going over plateaus or through mountain ranges. Number two, what about that unforested area? A, B, C, for fencing. No wood for fencing. A man named John F. Glidden, DeKalb County, Illinois, 1874, came up with barbed wire. The devil's hat band, the cowboys called it. And in a very famous example, two guys who were peddling barbed wire, the ranchers didn't believe barbed wire were going to keep these longhorns in. So outside of Laredo, Texas, they made a corral about as big as this room. And they put about five or six longhorns in and they stampeded them. And the longhorns ran into that barbed wire and they did it about two or three times and then, dazed and bleeding, they backed off and refused to move. And that proved to the ranchers that barbed wire would work, didn't need wood. B, for fuel, you use buffalo chips. There's pictures in great magazines of guys with wagons collecting dried buffalo manure on the prairie and stacking it just like you would wood. Wound together hay, dried corn on the cob, anything you needed to stay alive. Number three. During the New Deal in the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt got Congress to pass money to give to farmers to plant jack pines or what they called shelter belts. In other words, you planted a group of trees right out in front of your house and they acted as a wind fence or a windbreak. Try and keep that wind from blowing. Go through South Park today, you can see those big iron fences. Those are Wind breaks keep the snow from going over the road. And then lastly, in the absence of wood, you build your homes out of sod. And a great historian named Everett Dick wrote a book called The Sod House Frontier. You didn't need any wood. The hard sod would do. And on the roof, you would see eventually uh, wheat would be growing out of it, a little tree would be growing out of it, uh, weeds would be growing out of it because it's just sod. Number three said, well, what about a little rainfall? What kind of an impact did that have? Well, number, number one, you got to have irrigation. And with a windmill, you could get irrigation. B, you engage in dry farming. You raise crops that don't need a whole lot of rain. C, you build reservoirs to store water in dry years for, good, for use in bad years. Now the problem with reservoirs out on the Great Plains people, that is absolutely the worst place to put a reservoir because the wind blows 10 to 12 miles an hour and it's hotter than hell and you lose a lot of the water from evaporation. Unfortunately, the best place to put reservoirs are in places like the Black Canyon. Unfortunately for us. Four, D, you use windmills. If you don't have any water, you use windmill to pump water out of underground aquifers, the greatest of which is the Ogallala Aquifer. Kansas, Nebraska, part of Oklahoma, eastern Colorado, and so on. E, 
You use John Wesley Powell's concepts. F, we're getting desperate now. Dry ice, you seed the clouds. G, you pray. I remember in Upper Michigan, a number of times going to church on Sunday and the priest leading the prayer service. You pray for rain, whatever it takes. Number four, what about the high wind velocity? Well, the high wind velocity, people, A, has forced the planting of trees in the shelter belt. B, has made the windmill feasible. C, all of the smart people out on the Great Plains were ranchers because they did not plow up the soil. D, the high wind caused the dust bowl and caused blizzards. Whenever they get two inches of snow out around Burlington or Ray, Colorado, they close the schools and everybody in the Gunnison country laughs. But I can guarantee you they wouldn't be laughing if they were out there when a 50 mile an hour wind can pile up 10 to 12 foot drifts and you can't see your hand in front of your face driving along the road. That's why in South Park they got gates. Nobody drives in ground blizzards. The only way you can adequately drive in a ground blizzard is one guy in the passenger seat, one guy driving, the guy driving looks left, the guy in the passenger seat looks right, then you can see. You cannot see straight ahead. Number five, what about the unique form, or excuse me, what about the tremendous grassland that you had? Well. Couple of things. Number one, the grassland allowed the cattle industry to be successful, and B, the grassland protected the 10 to 12 feet of topsoil that had come off the Rocky Mountains over millions of years and flowed towards the Mississippi River, and it is the top topsoil in the world outside of the Ukraine. And with grass on top of it, it was protected, didn't blow away. Number six, what about that unique form of animal life? Well, as I told you before, kill the buffalo, kill the Indian. And it made long-range weapons necessary. Number seven, what about that unique form of enemy, the Indian? To fight the Indian adequately, everybody, you had to have a horse. Captain Bennett Riley went out to protect the Santa Fe Trail in 1832 with 200 dragoons, and they marched out onto the prairie. And damn near never came back because the Indians had horses and they didn't. And that was the last time the United States Cavalry ever ventured out on the Great Plains without horses. And lastly, and second B on that one, it also led to the introduction of the gun that won the West. Now, a lot of people say, oh, you're a Colt 45 revolver. And I snicker. A Colt 45 revolver, ladies and gentlemen, was used by cowboys for one purpose, and that was to shoot rattlesnakes. All this nonsense you see in the movies of a guy you know, doing this with a Colt 45 and knocking a guy off his horse at about 50 yards is ridiculous. Number one, they misfired a lot. Number two, the, when the bullet hit them, probably wouldn't have enough power to knock them down anyway. And number three, I would like to take everybody in this room, set up a fairly big can right by the window, and see how accurate everybody would be shooting with a Colt 45 revolver. You wouldn't do well. The gun that won the West was the Spencer repeating rifle. Up until this time, the white man had a single shot rifle. The Indian, I always say, had a repeating bow and arrow. So the white man shoots the rifle, and now it takes him about a minute at best to reload. And if you're on horseback, I can guarantee you, you're not tamping the powder in, you know, bouncing across the prairie. Number eight. What about the hard soil for agriculture? Well, the hard soil for agriculture led 
to the great farm implement companies of John Deere, Farmall, Fordson, Minneapolis, Moline, out of Peoria, Illinois, and Moline, Illinois. And now we have steel plows, steel drags, tractors, threshing machines, and you know the rest of it. You had to have steel implements out on the Great Plains. Number nine, what about the very few navigable rivers? Well, A, you needed a horse. B, you got the Pony Express. C, you used the telegraph. And D, ultimately, you used the railroad. And lastly, what about that huge expanse of area that you had? Farmers living 10 to 15 miles apart from each other. A, they were exploited by their representatives because there weren't very many of them and the representatives could care less. This would lead later on to the coming of the Granger Party and the Populist Party. And the definition of people in the Populist Party is Democrats and Republicans with grievances. And secondly, being isolated out there made them isolationist and conservative and radical and self-sufficient. Enough said. One last thing before we leave Walter Prescott Webb. Anybody wants to read about what really happened out on the Great Plains, reads Willa Cather, O Pioneer, My Antonia, E. V. Rolvog, Giants in the Earth, Hamlin Garland, The Middle Border, and Maria Sandoz, Old Jewels. That tells it the way it was. Willa Cather, one of the things I always told my athletes, reminded them all the time, the end is nothing, she said, the journey is all. The end is nothing, the journey is all. Of the women who lived on the Great Plains, nine out of ten had mental illness. Seven children born, three die at childbirth, blizzards, dust storms, Indians, no reading material. It's amazing they lasted as long as they did. Enough on the Great Plains. Another great book that tells about the same thing, Wallace Stegner, Beyond the Hundredth Meridian, also talking about Webb, talked about what Webb talked about and also what John Wesley Powell talked about. Today, Los Angeles, California has a local water supply capable of supporting 7% of the population. Denver, 15%. Phoenix, Tucson, Lubbock, Las Vegas, a lot less. So where do they get their water from? Well, obviously, they get it from elsewhere. Here's a statistic that is meaningful. The western slope of Colorado has 10% of the population, 33% of the land area, and 70% of the water. Water is where the people ain't. People ain't where the water is. A couple of sayings involving water. Whiskey, they say, is for drinking. Water's for fighting. Now, I got Richard Rosman over here, going to make the rounds with water. I checked with Frank Kugel of the Upper Gunnison today. We now have 71% of average moisture in the Gunnison country as we speak. So towards the end of the summer, there may be some calls on the water, and Rich is going to have to make some decisions here based on who's got the best water rights. And it may not be enough for everybody. The South Platte River, too thick to drink, too thin to plow. Water is the most cussed and discussed topic in the West. And ex-Governor John Love, water runs uphill towards money. So here we go, that's the introduction. The early irrigators of Colorado were the Indians of Mesa Verde, 1 to 1300. They're brilliant. The Indians of Mesa Verde had 
irrigation on the Mancos River on top of the mesa. As the water dropped down in these canyons, they terraced the canyons and they watered the canyons all the way down. And then they had reservoirs in the Mancos Valley down below. We don't have any sure idea why the Indians left in the year 1300, but we do know it was the end of a 27-year drought, 1292 to 1299, and all carbon-14 testings on anybody who died after 1299, nobody died after 1299. Everybody was dead before 1299, which meant by 1299 they're all gone. You know, we're very cocky, I think, around the world today. Mesoamerica eliminated by drought. Almost all great civilizations went down primarily because of drought. No great civilization ever lasts forever. The United States will not be any different. It's just a matter of time. <laughs> Following the Indians of Mesa Verde, a lot of early Mexican people in the San Luis Valley came in and retired fur traders. When they retired, the great days of the fur trade ended. They, would, uh, they didn't want to leave, so they'd have gardens, and they'd irrigate, and they got great crops. So along the Greenhorn, up on the Purgatory River, Fountain Creek, all these areas just east of the Rockies, they had gardens, and, and the crops are pretty good. David Wall, 1860, irrigated two acres of land near Golden and sold his produce to Black Hawk and Nevadaville and Georgetown, all those towns up Clear Creek Canyon, and the results of his irrigation were unbelievable. You get water on that rich topsoil and you can grow anything. And then, in 1870, a guy named Horace Greeley led the Union Colony out to the banks of the Platte River. He started the Union Colony. And at that point, they began to big, uh, dig canals. Prior to this time, the only irrigation you had was 50 feet on either side of the river. Now you're building canals and you're running it up on the bench lands. And now you're able to irrigate a lot more real estate. And everybody in those days always thought that there would be plenty of water, don't need to worry about it. And then as you began to run out of water, you began to use windmills to tap the underground Ogallala Aquifer. And then, Trans Mountain Water Diversion. Because the more people who moved in, the more water was used, and this is an arid area, and began to run out of water. Now, there are 38 water diversions from the western slope to the eastern slope, diverting 500,000 acre feet of water a year. And here are the big four, not in order of their importance. Number one is the Moffat Tunnel, 1937. How many people have ridden Amtrak? When you ride Amtrak, you go right through the Moffat Railroad Tunnel. Rollinsville and Toland on the east side, over to Winter Park or Frazier on the west side. And there is a water tunnel running right next to it, six miles long, taking water out of the Frazier River in Middle Park and dumping it out to Rollinsville and Toland for use in the Denver water supply. Secondly is the Colorado Big Thompson Project. Now, of the 500,000 acre feet diverted every year, 300,000 comes out of that one alone. And that one takes water out of the Colorado River, right where Grand Lake is. You got a couple of reservoirs, holding reservoirs, that are right next to it. Lake Granby is one. And now, on, underneath Grand Lake is a 13.3 mile long tunnel called the Alva Adams Tunnel, running right underneath Rocky Mountain National Park, coming out at Estes Park, 
and then going into Lake Estes, and from there down the Big Thompson River into Loveland and all the other farming areas on the eastern slope. That was built for $160 million from 1937 to 1953, with World War II intervening. Number three, the Roberts Tunnel. The Roberts Tunnel takes water out of the Blue River and tributaries, puts it into the Dillon Reservoir. From the Dillon Reservoir, a 23-mile tunnel goes underground and comes out on the South Platte River at the town of Grant, right on Highway 285. So if you're coming from Denver, you look on the right side of the road, right around Grant, you can see that big white opening, and that's where it comes out, or goes in. And it goes down the South Platte River into the Denver area. The fourth one is the Frying Pan Arkansas Project, 1962 to 74. Frying Pan Arkansas Project takes water out of the Frying Pan River. They put a reservoir in for the western slope called Rudai Reservoir. The six mile long Boosted Tunnel runs underneath Hagerman Pass, is dumped into Turquoise Lake right around Leadville, just below Leadville. From there goes to the Arkansas River and goes all the way into Pueblo, and that's why the Pueblo Dam exists. Didn't get built till 1975. And that water goes all the way down into southeastern Colorado to the John Martin Reservoir and into Lamar and La Junta and that area. Now they got one other diversion that's not Trans Mountain. It's in our neck of the woods. In 1901, two great men named Fellows and Torrance went down the Gunnison River and the Black Canyon to see if water might be diverted into the Uncompagre Valley. All the ranchers and farmers in the Uncompagre Valley, Delta, Olathe, Pea Green, Montrose, Ridgeway, Olathe, they're all leaving. They're going broke. They don't have enough water in the Uncompagre River. Temptingly, not far away, thunders the Gunnison River through the Black Canyon. Unfortunately, there is a big mesa between the Black Canyon and the Uncompagre Valley, and that is known as Vernal Mesa. In 1900, a guy named Frank Lazan took some readings, and he found out that the water in the Black Canyon, the Gunnison River in the Black Canyon, was higher than the Uncompagre Valley. So if you could ever build a tunnel, you could run it by gravity and you wouldn't have to pump it. Fellows and Torrance go into the canyon, 1901, working for the United States government and a new organization just established that year known as the Bureau of Reclamation, Reclamation Service at that time. And they found a tunnel site. And the Bureau of Reclamation began building in 1904. Six-mile tunnel running from the East Portal in the Black Canyon, six miles to within eight miles of Montrose. You drive by it every time you go there, nobody knows exactly where it is. I know where it is. <laughs> because I've been in there once legally, once illegally. 1975, I knew the ditch rider, Glenn Phillips, and we went in with a pickup truck. And you've got to have the gates open on both sides, obviously. And if you're claustrophobic, I wouldn't advise it. Six miles in a pickup. <laughs> Groups built from both ends, West Portal or Luani on the west side, East Portal or River Portal on the east side, they met in the middle 11 hundredths of an inch apart. And on September the 23rd, 1909, the President of the United States, William Howard Taft, came and threw the switch at Luani to start the water flowing, saving the Uncompagre Valley. First great Bureau of Reclamation project in history, the Gunnison Tunnel, six miles. Now the Taylor Reservoir exists today because of the Gunnison Tunnel. The Uncompagre water users out of Montrose and the Uncompagre Valley own 
the 106,200 acre feet in the Taylor Reservoir. But they got a better claim to the water because their other water claim goes back to 1910 when the Gunnison Tunnel was built. So they got two pretty good water rights. So those are your Trans Mountain water diversions. Now we come, I hate to say it, to court cases. The West is now going to learn a lesson the hard way. Because in an arid area, everybody wanted the water and going to fight like hell for it. Now, before we go on, two definitions. Number one, an acre foot of water that we are going to talk about is water one foot high covering one acre. That's an acre foot. There are two water, there are two water doctrines in the U.S. One of them is east of the Mississippi River, and it's known as the Doctrine of Riparian Rights. It basically says that you own the water in the river as you can use the water in the river as it goes by your property. Almost any amount, with two qualifiers. You can't take so much out that you stop steamboats from operating, and you can't take so much out that you stop mill wheels from operating. Well, I submit to you that if you're talking about rivers of that size, you're not worried about some guy taking a little water out as it goes by his property, because that's a water-rich area. That ain't going to work out in western part of the United States. And as a result, we adopted a water doctrine used by the Spanish and the Mormons, and it was known as the doctrine of prior appropriation, which we have today, which has two rules. Number one, first in time, first in use. If Vanna Bush comes into the Crested Butte area in 1878, and I file the number one water right on the Slate River in a dry year, everybody goes dry except me. I'm the last guy going dry. I get the number one water right. And secondly is, use it or lose it. Nobody can hoard water, and if you can't prove that you can make beneficial use of the water, you've got to give it up to other people who can. That's doctrine of prior appropriation. First court case, Kansas versus Colorado, 1901-1907. Took six years, the United States Supreme Court decided it. Immediately, the federal government said, some of the land that you guys are talking about is federal land. Don't worry about the court deciding it. We'll take care of it. And the Supreme Court, number one, said, bug out. Federal government's not going to decide anything. This is a matter for the courts. This involved a case involving two different water doctrines. Sort of. Kansas adopted the doctrine of riparian water rights in the eastern part of the state because they didn't want to say they were a desert. Everybody today, you know, hell, they advertise it. Come to the desert. I can't believe it. When I grew up, nobody wanted to go to the damn desert. And I guarantee you, nobody's going to the desert today except for one invention that came about 60 years ago known as known as air conditioning. I'd like to see how many people be living in Las Vegas without air conditioning or Phoenix or Tucson or a lot of other areas. So Kansas riparian rights, Colorado doctrine of prior appropriation. Kansas sued Colorado and said that farmers upstream are taking too much water out of the Arkansas River and Kansas farmers don't have enough water later in the year to use the water. Supreme Court said, aren't you guys taking water out of the Arkansas River and denying the people in Oklahoma downstream the right to use theirs? They said, yeah. Scrap that argument. Scrap that one. Colorado said, we believe in international law. And Colorado's international law said that wherever the water headed, if it headed in a particular state, wherever the water heads, 
That area controls the water. Screw the people downstream. In all the great rivers ahead in Colorado. In the court decision, the Supreme Court said that Colorado won the case, that Kansas could not prove any harm done to them. And while Colorado was celebrating, something else came over the ticker tape, and uh, somebody said, what else is coming in we haven't seen? He said, something about equitable apportionment. And the Supreme Court said it didn't make a damn bit of difference where the water headed and where it ran to. Everybody had an equal apportionment of the water, equitable apportionment. Now, the Supreme Court never said what equitable apportionment was. So in 1907, both Colorado and Kansas had spent a lot of money, hired a lot of lawyers, wasted six years, and neither side got anything close to what they wanted. But it would take another court case for them to kind of figure it out. And this one came in 1911, 1911 to 1922, Wyoming versus Colorado involving two states with the same water rights, doctrine of prior appropriation. All of you been up around Fort Collins. Fort Collins is in the Poudre Basin. On the west side of the Poudre Basin is the Laramie Basin. And the Laramie River heads there and goes right up into Wyoming. And what Wyoming was trying to prevent was Colorado digging a tunnel in the Laramie River and running it underneath the mountains into another basin, into the Poudre Basin. And the Supreme Court now had a rule on this. And here's what the court said. Number one, the doctrine of prior appropriation applies to interstate as well as intrastate streams, which means, and this is number two, it is perfectly legal to take water from one state and move it into another state and from one basin into another basin. Nothing wrong with that. So Colorado's starting to celebrate, but the Supreme Court said the only water that could be diverted in an underground tunnel is water that Colorado had rights to. And Colorado had rights to 15,500 acre feet, and that was not nearly enough to spend all that money to build that tunnel. Scrap it. No diversion. Eleven years had gone by. Lawyers had gotten rich. Cost a lot of money. Neither side got what it's wanted. And now the states in the West were starting to think that maybe litigation is not the way to solve water problems. And then, unbelievably, the federal government said, we are thinking about putting in a dam outside of Las Vegas near the town of Henderson, Nevada. And furthermore, we think that we are own all unappropriated water in the West's navigable, unnavigable rivers. That got everybody's attention in the West. What the federal government is saying is that if this water is unappropriate, they have the right to it and they're going to build a dam. And now the most famous of all water compacts is going to be signed. As all the Western states on the Colorado River say, we can't be screwing around litigation anymore. We've got to get our ass in gear, and we've got to beat the federal government. Now, we had in Colorado, I love this guy, Delph Carpenter from Greeley, one of the greatest water lawyers in history. What is going to happen in 1922 is this. All seven states on the Colorado River are going to send representatives to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And the guy who is heading this is the Secretary of Commerce, Herbert Hoover, later on going to be the President of the United States. Hot summer. A lot of these other states sent politicians. Colorado sent Dolph Carpenter. No better water lawyer ever existed. Here was what Dolph Carpenter was afraid of. 
Delph Carpenter was, was very much afraid that he knew that California was really starting to increase its population. And they could say, under the doctrine of prior appropriation, if they could make beneficial use of the water, they might wind up getting almost all the damn water in the Colorado River. Carpenter said that can't happen. And in the Colorado River Compact of 1922, the seven western states on the Colorado River decided amongst themselves who would get what water on the Colorado River. What Del Carpenter did was make an end around run on the doctrine of prior appropriation. Because when the Colorado River Compact was signed, it is the law of the river, it is a law, and now it doesn't make a damn bit of difference what California does. Colorado has got the rights to X amount of water, and so do the other states. This will all become obvious in a moment. Here are the provisions of the Colorado River Compact, which have been studied all over the world. Number one water compact of all time. Other countries have come to study it. And Del Carpenter, we owe a lot to. Number one, the upper and lower basin states are divided. The upper basin states are the states where the headwaters of the Colorado River and its tributaries head. Utah, Wyoming, Colorado, and New Mexico. The lower basin states are where the Colorado River goes to. Arizona, Nevada, California. The dividing line is a spot on the Colorado River where a Mormon missionary used to ferry people across, known as Lee's Ferry, better known today as Page, Arizona, or the site of the Glen Canyon Dam. Anything below that? Lower Basin. Anything above that? Upper Basin. That's number one. Number two. In all the testing that had been done before this time, it was assumed that the Colorado River produced 20 million acre feet of water every year. Since that time, we have found out that the Colorado averages 14.2 million acre feet of water a year. Testing is better, and we went through a bunch of wet years prior to 1922. So the upper basin states, now with this in mind, agree that they will allow 75 million acre feet of water to pass by Lee's Ferry every 10 years for an average of 7.5 million acre feet every year. I didn't call for more some years. But then they got to give less in another year. 7.5 and no problem. They get 7.5, we get 7.5 in the upper basin. We got 5 million in reserve, right? 20 million acre feet. And then we find out there's only 14.2. And we've agreed to have 7.5 go downstream, which means all that's left for the upper basin is 6.7. 7.5, 6.7 equals 14.2. Now, point number three, and this is a lesson to everybody, especially the women here. I'll use these people as examples. You never say forever. The third provision was, this act shall remain in perpetuity. George Bernard Shaw once said, you take a couple of people in love with each other, 20, 21 years old, line them up in front of a preacher, and they promise to love, honor, and obey forever, and they look at each other with shining eyes, and they just can't wait to say it. Six months later, silk stockings or nylon stockings are hung on the shower curtain. What's your boyfriend's name? Tim. Tim says, honey, would you please take the nylons off the shower curtain? And he says, she says, I'll do that when you put the damn cap on the toothpaste so it doesn't get hard when I squeeze it out. Individual differences pop in. And Shaw said what you should have said was, 
We'll promise to love, honor, and obey for six months, and then we're going to take a look at it. <laughs> you never say forever. And we said forever. We should have said 25 years, and then we're going to take a look at it. But it's the law of the river today. We are committed to send 7.5 million acre feet downstream. Number five, ominous. Any excess water goes to the area of greatest need. There are nine people living in Las Vegas. 500 maybe in Phoenix. 14 in Lubbock. 500,000 in L.A. And where did it turn out to be the greatest need? Did anybody ever envision a million to a half people going to live in Las Vegas? Two and a half in Phoenix, 36 million out in California, 8 million in L.A.? Hell no. But there's the greatest need right there. Number six, navigation and power are secondary to domestic and agricultural use. Let me say that again. Navigation and power are secondary to domestic and agricultural use. And number seven, and last, Mexico on the Colorado River gets 1.5 million acre feet of water every year to be taken equally from the upper and lower basins. So 750,000 comes out of the upper basin share and 750,000 comes from the lower basin share. And there it is, the Colorado River Compact, the greatest of them all. Unfortunately, nobody could envision air conditioning. Colorado River today carries the sixth largest amount of water of all rivers in the U.S. So it's not a particularly big river, but it is the most important river in the West because it is the only source of water in the Southwest. That's Colorado River Compact. Now we got another problem. The fourth district representative from the Western Slope was a man named Ed Taylor. Taylor Reservoir, Taylor Hall on the Western State Campus, Taylor State Road, now Highway 6, used to be Highway 6. He was the head of the House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee, 1908 to 1941. Seven years later, Another fourth district representative comes from the Western Slope, and his name is Wayne Aspinall. Born in Ohio, moved with his family to Palisade at the age of eight. They had peach orchards. Wayne Aspinall served in World War I, Colorado legislature, 1930 to 48, and now in 1948 he is elected fourth district representative and inside of four years, he becomes the chairman of the House Interior and Insular Affairs Committee, responsible for all water and land legislation in the country. Now, we had the water workshop starting at Western about 1970, and Wayne Aspinall came every year, and I got to know the guy very well. Got a lot of correspondence uh, still from him. I never, never thought higher of anybody ever than Wayne Aspinall. Glenn Saunders, the head of the Denver Water Board, told me that when experts testified before Aspinall's committee on a certain thing, Aspinall knew more than they did. One day, Representative Phil Burden of California, five terms, Democrats, same party as Aspinall, made a comment in the paper, which was true. He said, Aspinall's committee is so tough that when you want to go to the bathroom, you got to raise your hand. Five-term representative got to raise his hand. Aspinall didn't like it. And Phil Burton was in his office at 8 in the morning the next morning. And Aspinall said, Phil, is this, are these comments true? Well, I said, yes, Mr. Chairman. I said them a little bit in jest, though. 
And uh, Wayne Aspinall said, Phil, you got a little river and harbor bill out there in San Diego that you're interested in, aren't you? And Phil Burton said, I certainly do, Mr. Chairman. Wayne Aspinall said, do I need to say more, Phil? No, sir, Mr. Chairman. The idea was firmly implanted. No more talking to the press. No more embarrassments otherwise. Kiss that sucker goodbye in San Diego. In the early 1950s, it became obvious that when the people in the lower basin states wanted water later in the summer for irrigation, there were not enough holding dams in the upper basin to send the water down. They had plenty of water in the spring, but then it all ran off and you had nothing to hold it. And as a result, in the year 1956, Wayne Aspinall ushered through the famous Upper Colorado River Storage Act, which created six dams in the upper basin to hold water to be sent down to the lower basin states. Three of them are within 50 to 75 miles of us. Blue Mesa, Morro Point, and Crystal on the Gunnison River, that's three. Navajo Dam on the San Juan River, Farmington, New Mexico, four. Flaming Gorge on the Green River, Southern Wyoming, five. And the Glen Canyon Dam, Page, Arizona, is six. And the second part of the Upper Colorado River Storage Act were what Aspinall called participating projects. These are dams out in western Colorado and in the upper basin states that hold water for us. One example is the Paonia Reservoir. I'll give you an idea a little bit about Wade Aspinall. John Kennedy in 1963 in the summer called Wayne Aspinall up and he said, Wayne, we'd like to get the wilderness bill through this session so I can use it in the 64 campaign. And Wayne Aspinall said, well, Mr. President, we're not going to get to it this term, but we'll get to it right off the bat in the next term. And John Kennedy said, thank you very much, Wayne, and hung up. Nobody messes with committee chairman. And in 1964, the wilderness bill passed primarily because of Wayne Aspinall, Lyndon Johnson. And yet Wayne Aspinall was kind of hated by environmentalists. Wayne Aspinall did not want the lands in the West to be shut up. He wanted them to be used. So he was as good an environmentalist as, as anybody, but he wasn't a radical guy to say, shut it all down. Got beaten in the primary in 1972. Primarily beaten because a lot of the environmental people, and I'm one of them, didn't vote against them though, uh, were a little upset with Aspinall for the building of all the dams. Now we come to a few conclusions here. Conclusion number one. There is not enough water in Colorado and the West today because of the enormous population surge in the United States at the end of World War II. Now, one of the things I pose to my classes, and I talked to George Sibley last night, I got this Colorado water plan. I mean, there's only, there's only one conclusion that is going to happen with regard to water in the West and certainly in Colorado. All the rivers are over-appropriated right now. Number one solution is that people stop coming into this state and leave. That isn't going to happen. Solution number two will happen, and that is eventually, economics is the only thing that works. Eventually, sooner rather than later, water bills every month are going to be $10,000 a month. Now, we'd all like to live in Aspen, but with the average price $2.4 million, I'm not living in Aspen. I can't afford it. 
And with $120,000 a year in water bills, they can't afford it either, and that will stop people from coming in, and that is the only thing that will stop people from coming in. Because when they go into a subdivision, turn on the tap, they expect water to come out. Now, can this go on the way it is? Hell no. Can we continue increasing the population and increasing the population with a finite amount of water? No. Same thing in the world. I pose this to my classes also. What is the inevitable result of the burgeoning population of the world? We're already running out of water and food and land and so on. We all know what's going to happen. The four horsemen of the apocalypse are going to ride. Famine, pestilence, war, disease. Unfortunately, that, as I always tell my classes, used to say this working on construction, that is a lead pipe cinch. There's no way out of it. Everybody in Colorado today wants the water. Industry, recreation, agriculture, developers, cities, environmentalists, federal government, and power companies, they all want it. In the old days, not everybody wanted it. We have to recognize the aridity of the West. We live in an arid area, and sooner or later, we've got to come to a conclusion to the limitations on growth. Cannot go on. Cannot go on. If I'm around, I probably won't be for, you know, 25 years from now. I'll be talking to my classes about the great eastward movement. <laughs> and everybody in my class says, Vanna Bush, the name of this class is the westward movement. What the hell do you mean? People will be going back to Wisconsin and Michigan and Illinois and Indiana where the water is. The western slope and the eastern slope will continue to have confrontations. They've already dried up South Park. They've already dried up the area around Rocky Ford on the Arkansas River. Now, whenever, and I've expressed my opinions to Mr. Kugel and George Sibley on that uh, Governor's Commission, whenever the Front Range and Denver and the Eastern Slope wants to negotiate with water, their idea is, as John Kennedy said about Nikita Khrushchev, what's mine is mine and what's yours is negotiable. Not one drop across the divide. Conservation, no bluegrass lawns, less people. That's the only answer. National Research Council 2006, I'm quoting. The Earth is the hottest it has been in 400 years. Climate change and soaring population across the Southwest threatens to overwhelm the main water sources for tens of millions of people. The Colorado Basin is going to face costly, controversial, and unavoidable trade-off choices along with demands impeding the region's ability to cope with droughts and water shortages. There it is. Aren't I optimistic? Are there any questions involving water? We're all affected by it. Everybody is affected by it. Questions? Take a Sam. Duke Wayne Aspinall in the primary in 72. Uh, a good friend of mine, uh, he also talked at the Water Congress and um, uh, who ran against Aspinall and beat him uh, started with an M, Mor uh, Morse or something like M O R S E. Really good guy, he's a lawyer from Aspen. Top of the line guy. Uh, we had Wayne and, and uh, Morris at the same social, and, and you know, Wayne Aspinall is an old style guy. And, he wouldn't talk to him. 
This is a Democratic primary. Wayne never got out of the Democratic primary. But, you know, he was in his 70s then, but, you know, top of the line guy. So, in other words, in Western Colorado, from 1908 to 1972, outside of seven years during the war and a little before and after the war, we had two congressmen from the 4th District, Ed Taylor and Wayne Aspinall, and both were the head of the House Interior and Insular Affair Committees. At the beginning of class, you mentioned the percent of snowpack. What did you say that was? Uh, right now, 71%. And who, who, you know, Frank Kugel, Upper Gunnison uh, Water. water. Yeah. Okay, That's right on the nose as of, to, as of today. If you could look into your crystal ball, given the statement that you said that whiskey is for drinking, water is for fighting, you also implied that forever perhaps may not be forever. What do you foresee the future battles, you know, in Western United States over water? You know, the, the Gunnison country and Colorado, Western Colorado, has a great ace in the hole. And the ace in the hole is that we are committed to send 7.5 million acre feet downstream to California. They're never going to take any water out of this basin because the water is already overcommitted, and that came out in a court case about eight years ago. Now, there's, there's another something, though, that might affect what we're talking about here, and that is what we call the public trust doctrine. And the public trust doctrine basically says that the environment and fish and trees, et cetera, have a right to the water. And that is now coming into conflict with the doctrine of prior appropriation. Now, the, the worst way to solve these problems is in a court of law, but it'll, it'll probably go to a court of law because we're not smart enough to solve our own problems. That's why I give Governor Hickenlooper a lot of credit. He's got a Colorado commission trying to come up with a water plan. We have no water plan. Jim? You see, uh, yesterday or today, Governor Brown in California mandated 25% 20, cut for every city yep. of water usage. You're talking about 16%? In California, in, uh, in two areas, they have 4% of average and 15% of average. And this is the fourth year of the drought. He was standing at a spot where ordinarily be six feet of snow right now, and he was standing on the grass. Other civilizations have gone down for exactly the same reason. Sinclair Lewis once wrote a book called Can't Happen Here. <laughs> well, what he meant by that, it can happen here. He wasn't talking about water, though. Any other questions? If not, let's take a uh, five or seven minute break. You people have heard enough bad news. Hopefully we can go up with some better news. <laughs> a couple of people have asked me, folks, I bring this up to all of you, that Crested Butte itself has been growing pretty well. When I first came here in 1962, there were, I don't know, three or 400 people in town. Mine had closed, railroad tracks taken out, school left, 1967. In the Denver Post, I got a nice article I cut out, said, is Crested Butte going to become a ghost town? And then uh, when the school got started, I remember there's always been a big division between Gunnison and Crested Butte. Never could quite figure out why. <laughs> and I think it had, it had to do in the early days of uh, Crested Butte having a lot of immigrant people. The people of Gunnison thought maybe they were a little bit better. Today, most of the money's in the north end of the valley. <laughs> I think the worm has turned. But when the school was built, Again, a lot of people said, you know, they'll never have enough kids fill that school up. And then they had to put an addition on. And then they had to put another addition on. And I was there a couple days ago to talk to the third, fourth, and fifth graders, and it looks like down the line they may be putting another addition on. How many people do you say in the school? What did Stevie say? 
640 kids in the school. 640. Uh, how many people in this room, mostly from Crested Butte, think that growth has gone far enough in Crested Butte? Let's see the hands. Yeah, even if you're leaning one way or the other, let's see the hands. You got to go one way or the other. We got one, we got two, three. About eight, nine maybe. How many think we got room for more growth? Let's see the hands. Come on, folks, don't be acting the missions. Get them up. So it may be an even split. Maybe an even split. There's an annexation going in, right? Maybe. Maybe. They gonna take that dump out or not? That's what they. That's what they said they would do. Twenty-four thousand cubic yards of dirt. Wow. We're gonna have Schmidt, Fitzpatrick, Huckstep. They'll be here one of the last days of the class. You can ask all the appropriate questions to those guys. But Crested Butte is a microcosm of every other area we've talked about. We are extremely fortunate in that we are at the headwaters of the rivers where there is no salinity. Because the more that water goes downstream, the more salt it gets, the more nutrients it gets, the, the water gets less good. And we are perfect being upstream. There's some great books that I brought along I want you to be familiar with. This is this one by Norris Huntley, University of uh, Davis professor in California. It's called Water in the West. Tremendous story on the Colorado River Compact. Tremendous. Stephen Grace, Jim, you said he's talking this summer? Yeah. When? August. Okay. To whom? Public Policy oh. Forum. Public Policy. Damnation. Yeah, damnation. Talks about the building of the dams and the consequences of the dams. A lot of you heard of Mark Reisner, who's appeared at Western. Cadillac Desert. Tremendous. And here's one. It's kind of a scientific uh, study, also by Mark Reisner, with a forward by Bruce Babbitt, who used to be the Secretary of the Interior. Overtapped Oasis, Reform or Revolution for Western Water. So there it is. Now, how many people in this room were kind of in favor and like whatever USA? Let's see the hands. I had a good time. I enjoyed talking to those kids in the hot tubs. I enjoyed being in that big bowling ball and knocking the pins over. I enjoyed listening to the mariachi band. And that was some pretty good publicity for Crested Butte. But the bottom line that I'm trying to get to is when I came here, there was nothing up in this end. And now uh, they tell me there are more people living in Crested Butte South than Crested Butte. 2100, Crested Butte 1500, Meridian Lakes, Trapper's Crossing, River Bend. Put them all together. 5,000 people living in the north end of the valley out of a population of 14,000. I'm going to read you one little item. I want to finish off with a little uh, brighter note here. In fact, I'll tell you a little story before I finish off with a brighter note. See, I've given you I'm kind of the prophecy of doom today. And divisiveness. And divisiveness. <laughs> When Baghdad, Persia was the number one city and the number one civilization in the world around the year 1000, Muslim civilization way ahead of the Christians because they accepted learning. Christians didn't like the classics. They thought it was, quote, profane learning. A great story was told of a master who had a big estate outside of Baghdad who sent his servant into town to stock up on supplies for the next month, as he had done many times before. And a servant came back very early and without any supplies. And the master said, how come you're back early and where are the supplies? And the servant said, I got to get out of here. I got accosted by death in the marketplace. 
I'm leaving now and I'm going to Samora. It's a city about 20 miles outside of Baghdad. You know, there's a lot of fighting went around Samora. Whenever I hear, think of Samora, you know, our guys are out there fighting now. And the master said, you go ahead, go to Samora. I'm going down to the marketplace and find out what the hell happened with the guy you call death. And went in the marketplace, and he did run into death, and he talked to death, and he said, why did you jostle and threaten my servant in the marketplace? And death said, I did not jostle or threaten your servant in the marketplace. I merely expressed great surprise that he would be here in Baghdad today when I got an appointment with him in Samora tomorrow. <laughs> that is the death instinct of Sigmund Freud. Que sera, sera. Whatever will be, will be. Dr. Carl Menninger talked to the Psychological Association, 1952, got a standing ovation, which means it doesn't make any difference what the trends are. Something may happen in 15 years that we never heard of. I never heard of a damn computer in 1960. I still have a manual typewriter and plenty of ribbons to last. I don't Twitter, I don't tweet. So those things can happen. Now, my eyesight's good enough to look at uh, this under the lights here, so to speak. This is called The Land of Today by Arthur Chapman. It goes something like this. Out in the land where life is new and each sunrise brings its zest, where great tasks lure upon every hand and each road provides a quest. The strength of the hills and the calm of the plains are part of his heritage, who dwells in the west with a book of deeds turns over a thrilling page. In other lands, tradition weighs like lead on the buoyant heart, and the race is lost in many a case before the runner has made the start. But always here it has been today, and today will ever be, and no ghosts of unlived yesterday shall assert their mastery. There's always love for a land that's new, surpassing love for the old, and the carefree West with its deathless youth shall find no, hear, no ears grown cold. And so men turn as their fathers turned when adventure led the way to the west of the gold and the sky and the earth, where it's always a glad today. That's what Frederick Jackson Turner said. That's what made an American the presence of free land in the west. That's why I grew up on a farm. I have no intention ever of being in a city for more than one day. I live on the river in Gunnison with no neighbors. I like the peace and quiet, and I like to be a little lonesome. We're out of here. <laughs>